Welcome to the Sally and Ralph Duchin Memorial Campus Lecture Series. Our speaker, Dr. J. Everett Wright, is the J. Everett Wright Professor of Judaic Studies and Director of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Arizona. Wright received his Ph.D. from Brandeis University and did additional graduate study at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the Harvard Divinity School. He has been a visiting professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and at Dartmouth College, as well as a visiting scholar at Duke University. He served two terms as the president of the William F. Albright Institute for Archaeological Research in Jerusalem from 2006 to 2012 and was named a lifetime trustee in 2013. Professor Wright's area of expertise is early Jewish history and religion with particular interest in the field of early Jewish apocryphal texts. He is the author, editor, or co-editor of six scholarly books, including The Echoes of Many Texts, published by Brown University, The Early History of Heaven, published by Oxford University Press. This book was named to the list of Outstanding Academic Books for 2000 by the Association of College and Research Libraries. Baruch ben Naraya, From Biblical Scribe to Apocalyptic Seer, published by University of South Carolina Press, the Old Testament in Archaeology and History, published by Baylor University Press, and he currently has two book projects underway. Professor Wright has been at the University of Arizona for 32 years and has been awarded the university's two highest teaching awards, the Lester and Catherine Sherrill Creative Teaching Award and the Five Star Teaching Award. After serving 22 years as director of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies, Wright will step down from that position this December. Thank you for that really generous uh, uh, welcome uh, and that uh, kind introduction. Uh, you know, it was so generous. If my parents were still alive, my, uh, they both would have appreciated that. Um, my mother would have believed all of that stuff. Uh, so that's the, the good part of that, of, of that introduction. Very generous. You know, it's my great pleasure to be here to give this lecture in Sally and Ralph Duchin's series uh, in honor and now memory of both of them. Uh, you know, they've been great supporters of uh, Judaic Studies at the University of Arizona and of the university uh, for decades. And it's a, just a personal honor for me to be able to, to give this lecture, it's somewhat stepping outside of my areas of uh, expertise, to uh, give my opinions on some things and to connect some of the work I do with, in the ancient period with things that are going on today. Now, as uh, a person who works in the ancient period, some of the stuff that I deal with is uh, the uh, apocalyptic thought, apocalyptic literature. Uh, I give a course here at the university on the apocalyptic imagination. And I have to say, it's a fun course to teach, and I, I hope the students have a good time too. But in that course, we surveyed how the apocalyptic imagination appears in Judaism and Christianity and Islam through, uh, you know, 2,000 years, over 2,000 years. Uh, we start with biblical materials and come up to the modern time. And because I've been thinking about this for my dissertation related to um, apocalyptic literature, you know, my entire professional life. So in the last year or more, we've, I've noticed this increase in apocalyptic rhetoric. Uh, within our political discourse. And I thought, gosh, for this lecture, I want to do something a little different, to take my interest in apocalyptic uh, thought and apply it to the political discourse that we're experiencing today. And I will look at it in terms of three areas. Three areas I want to talk about. Uh, uh, we'll just survey quickly some contemporary voices, people who are using apocalyptic rhetoric in their speeches, uh, in their presentations on the radio and on TV, in social media, and then uh, look at after that, uh, just so that we see exactly kind of what I'm talking about, how people are expressing, and you know, some of the crazy ideas that come out of that, um, and how do we respond to it. I also want to give you an ancient example. The ancient example will be the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes and who lived at the site of Qumran on the banks of the Dead Sea. So I'll talk about how that apocalyptic cult uh, used the same kind of vocabulary that we're seeing today and what became of them. 
Uh, finally, I want to look at some issues of theory and practice. What, how can we understand this, uh, this apocalyptic imagination as is expressed in our political rhetoric? And how do we deal with it? You know, uh, we're coming up on uh, holidays where people gather uh, for Thanksgiving, for Hanukkah, for Christmas. And you're going to be sitting at the table with people who have ideas that, that you can't tolerate. How do you deal with that? And some of them will be quite apocalyptic. How do you deal with that? How do you be a good uh, relative or a good friend to people like that? And that's, that's how we'll end. So let's talk about some contemporary voices. Uh, Richard Hofstadter, back in 1964, was exploring what he called the paranoid style in American politics. It's a great book. It actually became foundational to a lot of work that goes on to this day in this area. And I think we can take some uh, principles from that book and look at uh, applying them in this, this apocalyptic rhetoric. Uh, just uh, to quote, and then he says, uh, the basic elements in the parano uh, paranoid style uh, in American politics uh, begins with the central image of a vast and sinister conspiracy, a gigantic yet subtle machinery of influence set in motion to undermine and destroy a way of life. I mean, how threatening could it be? How threatening could it be? There's some kind of, you know, hidden behind the scenes, uh, somebody pulling the cords. Um, and the goal is to undermine your way of life. How do you respond to that? It's a direct threat. This continues to this day. Uh, this kind of uh, assessment of, of Hofstadter's work and in a more, in a more recent uh, publication uh, in, on political uh, opponents, uh, how we deal with them and, and how we talk to them, uh, this quote struck me, the, uh, the oft-discussed driver of polarization in our discourse and its ne negative impacts, uh, it's how we perceive the other side. Undoubtedly true that people often see political opponents as evil, but they're also more, even more likely to see them as stupid. Now, once you start dealing with people like that, you know, your friends, your family, people you meet, where do you go? Once you've identified them as evil or stupid, pretty much a lot of doors close. And I think probably you understand how that is experienced. You experience that in probably daily life uh, uh, in dealing with people with different views. That kind of discourse is the problem. Uh, here's another one where they, uh, this is uh, you know a year or so old now. Uh, these people, uh, it's in a volume on uh, reassessing uh, Hofstadter's uh, uh, paranoid style in American politics. And what they, they did, another survey, this is survey the, the product of survey research. And this team came up with this conclusion. In the present research program, we observed that political conservatives were significantly more likely than liberals to exhibit paranoid ideation to be more distrustful of officialdom, and to espouse conspiratorial thinking in general and in particular. These observations are remarkably consistent with Hofstadter's 1964 historical analysis of the paranoid style in American politics. It continues. This is apocalyptic. President Zelensky. Now, uh, we support the Ukrainians in their efforts uh, in dealing with the, this Russian uh, war against them. And, but what did he say? The end of the world has arrived. This is back in March when it started. And the end of the world has arrived. And for him and his people, it's, it seems like that. Uh, I would say it's not the end of the world, but you get the point. And what he's using is apocalyptic uh, vocabulary this rhetoric in order to, to generate support. Uh, he said that in the context of trying to get European and American support for uh, the war effort uh, in resisting the Russians. Victor Urban, uh, uh, this last uh, August, was addressing uh, the CPAC. And the, uh, what did he say about uh, 
the uh, upcoming European elections and the American elections. Here's what he said. And now Orban is an authoritarian Hungary. These two locations, Europe and the United States, will define the two fronts in the battle being fought for Western civilization. You didn't know it was that bad. Today we hold neither of them, yet we need both. The front in Europe and the front in, in America. Democrats hate me and slander me in my country as they hate you, conservatives, and slander you. We should unite our forces. Uh, I can't imagine we want to unite with an authoritarian like Orban. But you can see how he's doing this. It's a battle be for Western civilization itself. And it's not that we just have disagreements on policy. It's not just that. They hate me. They hate you. In other words, they're beginning the process of dehumanizing us. And we should fight. We should unite our forces and fight. It goes back to Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, when he was, um, uh, just before the Republican National Convention, back in 1912, he uh, met with his, uh, uh, on the eve of the start of the convention, he was trying to gather his forces uh, uh, in support of his run. And he noted this, we fight in honorable fashion for the good of mankind. Okay, this is a political uh, you know, convention, and it's the good of mankind. Fearless of the future, unheeding in our individual fates, with unflinching hearts and undimmed eyes, we stand at Armageddon, and we battle for the Lord. Okay, so his, he's trying to stir up his followers. He uses this kind of apocalypse, the Armageddon, this final cataclysmic battle between good and evil. And of course, the Lord is on his side. You knew this was coming. The do-nothing Democrats and their leader, the fake news, lamestream media, are doing everything possible to hurt and disparage our country. No matter what we do or say, no matter how big a win, they report it as if it was a loss or not good enough. They're the enemy of the people. So the media are the enemy of the people. Now, authoritarians, one of the things authoritarians do, and uh, you know, recently I've spent the time just uh, studying authoritarians and how they function. And one of the things they do is they start discrediting the media. They discredit the media uh, so that you won't trust them. Discredit the justice uh, system, the judges, so you won't trust them and the legislature, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the work of an authoritarian. Couldn't resist this one. Now that's something special. I am the anointed one. Now anointing is what you do for a messiah, for a king, for a priest. And uh, former President Trump wants to claim that mantle, uh, it's, at least as it relates to economic issues. Here in Arizona, uh, our Republican candidate for uh, the uh, governor's office, Ms. Lake. It is not just a battle between Republicans and Democrats. It's a battle between freedom and dignity, between authoritarianism and liberty, between good and evil. That's as apocalyptic as it gets. It's not just a debate over policies. We're not having just a debate over policies. We're actually the 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 race for the governor of Arizona is a battle between good and evil. And otherwise, and obviously she thinks she's on the good side. I would think she's on the authoritarian side. Uh, Senator Cruz, it's like the old Roman Coliseum where you slam on a breastplate and you grab a battle ax and you go to fight the barbarians. As they say in the military world, it's a target rich environment. Okay, here is another statement to CPAC and uh, this last August. Now, what he's referring to, that breastplate, that's a New Testament reference to the breastplate of righteousness uh, mentioned in uh, Ephesians and Thessalonians, Thessalonians. And what happens? He's drawing on this kind of rhetoric, these images, to bring you in. Lord Trump, there's a true war in America right now, and it's good versus evil. It's not that we have policy differences. 
which is really what we have. We have policy differences. We have pers differences in perspective and how we approach things. But she sees it as good versus evil, it's part of the family thing. And we had to put in Laura Bulbert, a uh, representative from Colorado. Uh, we know, and this she said to a Christian group, uh, but notice what she's drawing on. We know that we are in the last of the last days. So she's talking about the end of the world. It's not a time to get upset. Uh, to get upset about. I would think the end of the world would be something to be concerned about. She's not worried. It's a time to know that you were called to be part of these last days and to you get to have a role in ushering the second coming of Jesus. Now, she is entitled to whatever religious belief she wants and to support uh, uh, anyone's uh, in their religious beliefs. But when those religious beliefs start involving harm to other people, or even harm to oneself, it crosses a line. This is a crossed line. Because what does she believe? These last days, when Jesus comes, if you read the New Testament, read the book of Revelation, the only people who will survive are Christians. And people like Representative Bobert want you to know that you're in that group. But the only people in that group, according to the book of Revelation, are Christians. And she would say, it's not just Christians in general, but her kinds of Christians. So she's even eliminating, probably, many Christians. It's extremism. Senator Scott, let's be clear. What the militant left is now proposing is not simply wrong, it's evil. Again, black and white. It's always black and white. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it's just on the right. Here we have, I'm gonna, you're going to have some examples here on the left. Uh, Mika Brzezinski, uh, and uh, excuse me, I've misspelled her name. The X is supposed to be a Z, I believe. Um, we do not want to make a differentiation between Democrats and Republicans. And I'm sorry, good and evil at this point. She fell into the same trap. She's using this apocalyptic uh, rhetoric uh, on her morning uh, sh news show, Morning Joe. Um, just this past summer. Secretary Clinton, you cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for and what you care for, what you care about. You can't be civil with them. I would argue you can. And I would suggest that she talk to her husband, who f was one of the founding chairmen of our very own National Institute for Civil Discourse in Washington, D.C. She can't be civil, but he's in leading a National Institute for Civil Discourse. Maybe they should talk it in the, at night over dinner, and she will f figure out how to be civil. You can be civil. When you're sitting down with friends or family that you disagree with, you can be civil. You can discuss without getting into this kind of black and white, good versus evil stuff. President Biden did a great job. I'll quote him at length here. I ran for president because I believe we were in a battle for the soul of this nation. I still believe that to be true. I believe the soul is the breath, the life, and the essence of who we are. The soul is what makes us. But first, we must be honest with each other and with ourselves. Too much of what's happening in our country is just not normal. And he hit the nail on the head with that. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. And he goes on to say, not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. You know, and we find that out more and more uh, as some of these co you know, come out from the shadows uh, with less fear of him. I know because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. Beautiful. I have to give you a, a, a warning. There's some slides coming up where he's going to betray that. But it's the, it's, this is the right attitude. Putin, uh, he talking about the West, that means us. Uh, he calls us Western elites. And he says that we're, um, uh, we're, we're a challenge to traditional life. And what he says, this complete renunciation of what it means to be human, the overthrow of faith and traditional values, and the suppression of freedom are coming to resemble a religion in reverse. Pure Satanism. So you didn't know, according to Mr. Putin, you're a Satanist because of how you function. Right? This, this is how we whip people up. Yet we have ambassadors who do a great job. Right? And uh, our ambassador to the UN. 
uh, Miss Thomas Greenfield. Talking about Putin putting his forces on, his nuclear forces on special readiness. We are concerned and we should take it seriously. This is a sign again that he's desperate. So, no, she doesn't go off on it. She responds with, with, with balance. And our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, said the same in a similar tone. We've communicated directly, privately to the Russians, and at very high levels, that there will be catastrophic consequences for Russia if they use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Very clear. But we know what happens when you use nuclear weapons. It's not going to go well. Here is just a, a screenshot of Princeton's Science and Global Security Program and how they imagine a nuclear exchange will happen. Uh, this is a, you can go and watch this. And it's the sad thing, it's called Plan A. I, I wish there were another plan that didn't involve all of this as Plan A, but they call it Plan A. Uh, I would hope this would be like Plan Z, but it's Plan A uh, in their uh, listing of these things. You can go to their website and watch it. It's a five-minute video. But in the end, basically, we're all wiped out. Uh, which reminds me of uh, Khrushchev. And what did he say to um, the, uh, Mr. Knox, the head of Westinghouse, trying to use him as a back channel to Kennedy? I'm not interested in the destruction of the world, but if you want us all to meet in hell, it's up to you. Going that direction. And here, Biden took the bait took the bait. We're not facing, we're, we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think there's any such thing as the ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon. So he, 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 he also uses the Armageddon theme. And because it galvanizes, it galvanizes. Where does this Armageddon stuff come from? It comes from the Bible. Uh, I think I can speak authoritatively authoritatively on that. And um, uh, in the book of Zechariah, on that day, which is an apocalyptic term, the phrase, right? Uh, on that day in the end, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. This, these, these are referencing uh, defeats. And in the book of Revelation, Demonic spirits performing signs will go out to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of Almighty God. They will ass they assemble them at the place that in Hebrew is called Ar Megiddo, Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo is not a mountain; it's a it's a tell or a hill, and it's on a plain. Uh, and my colleague Eric Klein has this book, The Battle, uh, Battles of Armageddon, where he traces Armageddon through history. It's the end of the world. Cataclysmic battle. That's what they're pulling on. And what happens is this rhetoric is separating us. You see here a chart from Pew. Uh, and just this, this past summer. And what it shows is, if you look at the um, graphs here, what it's showing is each uh, party's view of the other party and whether they view them favorably or unfavorably. Now look what's happening. Uh, the un you know, unfavorable and then you know, very unfavorable is escalating. So you know, in, the, in the last uh, you know, uh, 25 years, uh, we, we've just gone, it's gotten worse and worse. It shows up also in their, in their survey of how they, each party views the presidency of the other party. And the gap of how they uh, view them favorably or unfavorably is widening, starting um, you know, all the way on the left where it grows to the right. See, the, and the key is in the middle. See how the, the gap is widening. And the colors are the Republican, when a Republican is in party, uh, it's red on the top. When a Dem Democrat is in charge, it's blue on the top. And notice how they, they're, 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 the gap is growing. We're, we're dividing ourselves. And the divide, the divide is getting bigger and bigger. So it's clear we have a serious divide. And what exacerbates this? Precisely this kind of vocabulary, this apocalyptic vocabulary. And it's, I can give you an, an ancient example. The dead, people of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in, in the mid-40s in caves uh, along the Dead Sea at a site of Qumran, at the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. Uh, you know, a remote uh, place, dry, and uh, I mean, you, you can't get more remote. Basically, you go drive to, the, to nowhere and keep going. It's a, uh, you know, a, a remote place where this apocalyptic sect uh, had its headquarters. And what they did was they, hided what they hid when the Romans were about to attack. They hid their scrolls in these caves 2,000 years ago. And we find them in 1946, the, the winter of 45, 46, these two uh, Bedouin. Now, uh, you know, those are handsome chaps and, uh, you know, love the mustaches. These guys uh, were Bedouin and one of their goats uh, went into a cave and he tried to get it out. He threw in a rock and heard this big crash. Uh, I don't know why you would throw a rock at an animal in a cave thinking it would come out. But <laughs> that was his technique. So what he did was he thought he was scared. He didn't know what was in there. So he went and got his cousin. They went back and they brought out these uh, big jars with these scrolls in them. And they took them and, and took them to the city and uh, sold them off. I will tell you, these are leather parchment, the leather scrolls. And uh, they didn't take them up for some time. And be, they thought they didn't know how valuable they were. They were using the, the leather to line their sandals, their shoes. Uh, so we don't know how much we lost. Right? One of their texts is uh, the Manual of Discipline, or Com Community Rule. Now this is uh, we call basically the Qumran Community's Constitution. Uh, it's a lovely text, and it tells us how to become a member. You have to swear a loath of loyalty. It's like you know you 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 commit yourself to joining it. You have to sever separate from evildoers. That means separate from even your family and friends, because they're evil. If they're not in the group, they're evil. See how this is working out? If you're with us, you're good. If you're not, you're evil. You have to submit to superiors, right? Start thinking about some aspects of, of, of cult of cooperation of some, some elements within our political parties. This is a two-year probationary period, and after the end, there's a review, and you're either admitted or expelled. Now listen to what they say about one another. Here's the opening of this Manual of Discipline. This is a book belonging to the Teacher of Righteousness, is his name. Uh, he's the leader. And what is his job? He shall teach his people to love everything God chose and to hate everything God rejected, to distance themselves from evil, and to cling to all good deeds. So it's God's way, anti-God's way, the good and the evil. He shall teach them to love all the children of light. That's their group. But also to hate all the children of darkness. And they join the group and they must not deviate in any detail from any of God's words concerning their times. In other words, they have to follow the ideology completely. No deviation. Then what shall happen? The priest shall bless all of those of the lot of God, the members of the community, who walk faultless in all God's ways, saying, May God bless you with every good thing and protect you from every evil. The Levitical priests, on the other end, shall curse. Okay, so you got blessing and cursing. All those of the lot of Belial, Satan. May you be cursed for all your wicked deeds. Here's how they're imagining the other. And think about this in our political discourse. The others are so evil, we, ha have to we have to just get rid of them. May you be cursed in for all your wicked, guilty deeds. May the God of terror give you over to relentless avengers. Right? You know, punishing angels. May he visit your offspring with utter destruction. So even your offspring. By the hands of those who exact recompense. These punishing angels. May you be cursed without mercy. Oh my God. For your dark deeds damned in the shadows of eternal flames. It gets worse and worse. May God have no mercy on you. I mean, can you think of such a thing? May God have no mercy on you when you cry out, nor forgive by atoning for your sins. May he lift up his furious countenance against you for vengeance. May you never find peace. 
How would you like to think about people in that way? That's what's happening in our political discourse, some aspects of it. So this group, it's a strict dualism, right? Good versus evil. And the people waffle between the two. You can't, you, you, you have to be one or the other, but people waffle. And they're, they'll suffer for it. They're rewarded or punished for their good or evil deeds. And this shows the importance of being part of the good side, the side of truth, the side of God, the, the, the side of, of, of God's favor. Crazy, but it's how we work. Think of their vocabulary. Now here's where it gets close to us. They're part of the light. Their enemies are in darkness. They're good. The enemies are evil. This uh, sounds like uh, the people we, we heard from earlier and we hear from every day. They're worthy. Their opponents, unworthy. They're blessed. Their opponents, cursed. They're going to heaven. The others are going to, you guessed it, hell. God's on their side. Belial, or the devil, Satan, is on the other people's side. That's how bad. And you notice, you know, this, this complete othering of their enemies. Now, when you other them so terribly, and this is what happens in our political discourse, and it, it's hurting us, you make, you make them so other that you can treat them with, with in inhuman ways. There's a danger especially in the hands of an authoritarian. Now, they had a scroll. They even had a scroll called the War Scroll. That's the name we've given to it. Uh, that details an apocalyptic battle between good and evil. These people sat around and came up with a text that describes how the battle's going to be fought, how all the different forces on either side are going to array and how they're going to clash. Uh, the good will win three battles, the evil will win three battles, and finally God intervenes. But here's how they talk about it. On the day of calamity, think of Armageddon, the images you have of Armageddon. The children of light will battle the children of darkness amid great shouts of great multitude and a clamor of gods and men to display God's power. It will be a time of tribulation for the people God will redeem. No afflictions shall be as this from its sudden beginning to its end in eternal redemption. They get the good stuff their enemies get the, you see, dehumanizing. They're going to be wiping them out. Think about how some of the people are talking about, you know, uh, you know, these people are evil in our discourse. These apocalyptic groups, they start out as, as part of the mainstream, but they go in their own different direction. And because of their, their nature, they, cause, they can cause havoc, both in individual and corporate lives. Now, theory and practice. This will be familiar to you. Hardly needs uh, you know, comment. The stirring up of these uh, uh, insurrectionists and sending them to the capital, leading to conflict that is, you can't imagine that it was, that happened. Friends, uh, texting and emailing me while this is going on from overseas, mostly from Israel and, and from the UK. Uh, what is going on there? And they see these images. All that political discourse led to this. It's evil. You have to attack it. There were people in there screaming for, for hanging Mike Pence, Vice President Pence, and for uh, uh, trying to find Nancy Pelosi. Thank God they didn't find either of them. And obviously we had from Arizona the, the, you know, the shaman, the QAnon shaman. We can always be proud of that. But this is an example of this in a secular sense. And the connection between the secular and the religious has a long history. Ben Jones talked about this in his book, Apocalypse Without God. Uh, these themes are common. And uh, he's done a great job doing this. And what happens is those themes, they bind people together and give them some kind of hope for a utopian future. But it's not going to happen. Utopia never comes. It never will. We're, we're left with ourselves in how we re-interact. Now I want to go with how I 
uh, and some others feel about what's happening. Perception. Things are just what they seem to be. All right? uh, and how do you, how do the, uh, why are these people feeling what they feel? They feel alien. They feel left behind. They feel uh, marginalized. Their, their values aren't respected. Uh, their way of life is coming to an end. And the world looks hopeless. You can understand why they're upset. I can see why these people who, who reacted in Washington as they did. I understand their, their, their anger. I don't understand their reaction. What do they want? They want to see that life has a goal, a purpose, and they want to see themselves as affecting the, uh, making themselves in charge. Now, were they to get in charge? They would just oppress other people. And we would have another, we just have the, the same thing going on in a different way. What do they want to do? How do they do it? They blame the other, right? Remember, good versus evil. People of light, the people of darkness. The people of God, the people of Satan. All that kind of stuff. And what do they do? They join groups that do that. And they can do it in groups that meet or online. There are no lone wolves anymore. You hear about lone wolves? No lone wolves. Because they have online communities. And they can go out and do their thing. Meaning in life. They're, the meaning in life that they, they're striving for uh, is come is they want to realize it. They're also cared for by their, um, uh, just the, the very act of striving to get it, to get to their goal. They're, they're working together in what they do. So it's actually the process is, is important for them. But how do we respond? First of all, I would recommend listening carefully. Now this goes as you interact with people in your daily life, but a, also, as you get together as family groups during holidays, you know, sometimes we always worry about it. You always got the crazy uncle, right, who's going to go off. Uh, I'm probably that uncle in our family. So uh, I'll find out, uh, you know, in a few weeks. Well, uh, you have to challenge bizarre, dangerous ideas. You have to just be direct about that. But you also have to connect people uh, who are in this kind of mode with others who used to be there and who are coming out of it or who have abandoned that and why they did. And you provide them with new connections. Think about things in different ways. And I'm sure people are thinking they're trying to do that with me. And in the end, you have to keep listening. And it's not just letting them talk. It's listening and trying to help them understand. Right? It's my job here as a professor. What do I do? I try to educate people. And I'm not interested in indoctrinating anyone. I want them to understand both sides and why different, the different sides of issues think the way they do and what they want out of it. Because once you can do that, and if you can't argue their side, then you don't understand it. So you have to listen. We have to address those policy things. That was the personal side, the policy side. There are issues about that we have to address that are, are you know, are uh, issues that are economic issues, uh, poverty, education. Uh, a lot of these people have a poor uh, employment opportunities. We have to address those things. And uh, all the things that will impact their lives. Uh, climate change is, we have to worry about that. In the end, we have to keep listening. But political discourse uh, will, is, has been in the past, will continue to be linked with this kind of apocalypticism. Uh, ancient prophets did it. You read the Bible, right? The prophets are talking to the king. Hey, you need to do this, you do that. Uh, predicting the future, this is what it's going to be, right? That kind of stuff goes on to this day. They have it, we call them advisors today. The book of Daniel is an example of an apocalypse in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. And he's criticizing the, the Hellenization of Judah. The book of Revelation, criticizing the Roman domination, right? Now, I want to introduce, if you haven't heard about it, a, an idea of called political realism. And uh, Professor McQueen at Stanford has a very uh, good book. I think it came out a couple years ago. Political realism in apocalyptic times. Political realism really is saying there is no uh, utopia to come. There's just working together and trying to work things out. And one side wants to get power over the other, then the other tries to get power over the other side, and you have this going back and forth. And really all it is is a, is a string of accommodations. How will we accommodate uh, ourselves to, to others and, and, and 
giving them some space as they give us some space. Uh, and what do you have to do uh, to deal with this apocalyptic stuff? She calls in two words, rejection uh, and redirection. Rejection involves trying to get them to understand that there's no easy fix. It's a matter of accommodation. We have uh, issues of uh, uh, the abortion issue, right? big uh, change this summer. And it's, it's not one side or the other. We have to come to some kind of accommodation, some social agreement on how we can work together. It's not one way or the other. Redirection is taking their apocalyptic stuff and redirecting it, saying, yeah, I understand these uh, images that you're, using, that you're deploying and what you want to see, but let's take that and see about not just a, an ultimate apocalyptic end, but seeing a way to accommodate and work with one another so that we can make some kind of concessions, one with the other. An important way of doing it. And here are my, my takes on this. One, one side never achieves the final victory. There's no final victory because whatever happens, there'll be a backlash. And there's no utopia. It won't happen. We have to make a society we can live with. It involves give and take. Uh, it won't ha we won't have that peaceful utopia. Uh, political apocalypticism at the same time is ignoring that other side because you've, you, you've othered them so much, they're so evil, you don't even have to deal with them. Well, that's not going to work because they're still going to be around. So there has to be some accommodation. We have to be willing to, to admit that we don't know everything, right? And that's hard. Uh, and what we need is, in my view, reformed uh, debate. The reformed discussion, it reformed, informed debate, informed discussion, and use that to advance, you know, some kind of accommodation. And political realism, in my view, starts with us. And I got a couple of great examples. Here, I'll end with this, a couple of great examples. Reagan and O'Neill. Now, there are two people who couldn't be farther apart, but they had a compact. Come five o'clock, if they would call one another, it's, a, it's five o'clock, time for cocktails. And they dropped their work of the day and they started to work. Yeah, here you have a couple of Irish politicians, right? And what they were able to do was get to a point where they could uh, work with one another. As different as they were during the day and could you know, go back and forth on policy issues, there came a time when they could work together. And they enjoyed those times, as I understand. Another example, the Obamas and Bushes. I, I love this photo. This is exactly the kind of uh, comedy that we should have, uh, the ability to work together. Again, couldn't be more different. And yet they were able to work together. Uh, and they, they've created a good friendship, just a personal friendship. And we could use that. We could use that in our daily lives at work, uh, and around the table, uh, with our immediate family and with others, to be able to, to exhibit understanding and care for the others. And I'll close with this. Uh, Reverend Parker, as you know this quote. You, you may well know this quote. Uh, important leader in New England. The moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. Now that arc is long, but it arcs. And every little bit where we can find a way to work together, we will move ourselves towards a better ending, better relationships, a better society. And I think that's something that Sally and Ralph Duchin would very much like us all to do, to work towards a better society, to, to repair the world, tikkun olam, to make the world a better place little by little. Each of, us have a part. Each of us have a part. I've enjoyed my part at the University of Arizona and in our community, and I'm thankful for people like Sally and Ralph who've made this lectureship series uh, and many other things in our community. They helped the world become a better place, and I hope this lecture does some too. Thank you for your time. And I'll see you next time.